Welcome to chapter three. Uh, after looking at all those minerals, we're now going to move into rocks. Uh, and so with chapter three, we begin with the first of the three rock types, igneous rocks. And uh, of course, you might be able to imagine that these rocks down here are actually volcanic rocks. But honestly, we're going to split igneous rocks up into two chapters. We're going to start with uh, looking at intrusive igneous rocks, and then we're going to move to extrusive igneous rocks. And extrusive igneous rocks are volcanoes, for the most part. Um, so this is not a good photo for what we're going to be talking about. This is a better photo for what we're going to be talking about. So what is this? That's right, it's a granite countertop. Uh, very good. If you look closely at this granite countertop, you may start to recognize some things you've seen before. We spent a lot of time looking at minerals and you look at these big pink blobs and you go, hmm, that looks a lot like the feldspars we were looking at. And these little white areas maybe look like the quartz and maybe some of these black things look like biotite or hornblende or some of those darker minerals we looked at. Uh, this is kind of the stuff we're going to be talking about for this chapter. But again, let me back up. Uh, I wanted you hopefully to watch a little video on the rock cycle. Uh, so if you haven't done that, please go do that real quick uh, if you don't have a good understanding of that. But uh, something I want you to understand is we we looked at you know a couple dozen different minerals. However, a lot of those minerals are kind of rare. You don't necessarily see them all the time when you're walking around outside or just walking around on the surface of the earth. Uh, there's just, for the most part, there's just a few minerals that make up the majority of, of the, uh, the earth's crust and the earth in general. And I kind of want you to know uh, what those are. We call them the uh, rock forming minerals. And so this is the most abundant minerals in the earth's crust. And you notice more than half here, or let's just say half, are feldspars. So we had two feldspar samples in our mineral box. Uh, one was kind of pink, another one was occasionally kind of a lighter color, sometimes pink, sometimes gray. It can be a lot of different colors. Uh, but these are uh, silicate minerals. These are the pink things in granite, or sometimes the white stuff in granite, but they make up the majority, uh, or about half of the Earth's crust. They're really important. And then over here, we have quartz, and we have pyroxenes and amphiboles. These are those dark minerals we looked at, the hornblende and the augite. Those two there are kind of hard to tell apart. The micas, so remember those flaky micas, the biotite and the muscovite. Uh, and then clay minerals, and then, then kind of the other, other stuff. Uh, some of the clay minerals are, we looked at kaolinite, that's a clay mineral. Uh, so ju just so you know, some of these minerals are arguably more important than others. Uh, and that's why I kind of, you know, there's a lot of quartz in that box. Plus, this is Arkansas. Quartz is important. Uh, and then we have a lot of these feldspars. So I really want you to take a look at those feldspars because we're going to be looking at this stuff uh, a lot. So, kind of sticking with that rock cycle, I kind of want to look at this, this image. This is kind of a neat image. Uh, there's a lot of sort of regional geology going on with this image. We can talk. We can see the entire rock cycle kind of in this, in this photo. If you don't know quite what you're looking at, um, here's a map on the top, right? You can pretend this is the, uh, the west coast of the U.S. Let's pretend we're up near Oregon and Washington or something like that. Uh, so here you have, uh, if you're familiar with Seattle, maybe this is Mount Rainier and this is uh, Mount St. Helens and Mount Hood or something like that. Uh, and tectonically, we have a plate, an oceanic plate, that's subducting underneath the continent. So this is kind of the underneath look at it. We're looking at it sideways on the bottom here, and up here is a map, kind of a map projection. So what's going on? We've got oceanic crust that's crust that's being created out here somewhere. It is being subducted underneath the continent, and as it gets farther down, it starts to melt. So we had igneous rocks as this oceanic crust. They get subducted. They start to melt. They're back into a magma. They eventually make their way back to the surface. They erupt. They become igneous rocks once again and then they start being weathered and eroded, which we'll talk a lot about that in the coming chapters, but uh, they become weathered into sediment, and then that sediment collects uh, out on the edges in these basin areas and these low-lying areas, and that sediment can turn into sedimentary rocks, 
So there we've gone from an igneous rock to a sedimentary rock. And then because of all the pressure that's involved around here, we can start to metamorphose uh, some of these sedimentary rocks here. Uh, and so we can get metamorphic rocks in these areas, and sometimes you can get metamorphic rocks uh, around this, this magma here. Uh, but we'll talk more about that later. But there you go. That's kind of the entire rock cycle sort of in this, in this picture. But for this chapter, what we're going to be dealing with uh, is kind of a lot of this stuff in through here. You can see this whole whole thing is this, this crust here uh, is igneous rock. And it's kind of the stuff we're going to be talking about in these blobs a little bit right here for this chapter. So chapter three, igneous rocks. I'm going to kind of shorten it to intrusive rocks. We'll talk about what intrusive rocks are. Uh, the different types of intrusive bodies, so the stuff, the different types that can form. Uh, and I won't get too much into classification of these rocks. That's something I want to leave for uh, class, and we'll talk about kind of how we classify these things. And igneous rocks are, to me, fairly easy to classify. Like, they, they make a lot of sense. They're easy to kind of, you know, put into the, their little individual boxes as science likes to do to classify things, to understand things better. Uh, and then I'll maybe touch a little bit on this, but for the most part, we're going to just talk about these intrusive bodies, and I may just touch a little bit on the classification. So, what are intrusive rocks? So, you're probably used to volcanoes. You know what a volcano is. They erupt lava, and that lava cools, and it turns into rocks. Those are not intrusive rocks. Those are extrusive rocks. The intrusive igneous rocks are the stuff down here that cools off before it gets to the surface. And they look a lot different than the stuff that's up here. Why? Because the stuff that's down here will cool off much more slowly. And if you cool off a magma slowly, you can give time for the chemistry that's in that magma the stuff that it's made out of, you can give time for the chemistry, those, those atoms, they can take their time to bond with each other and start making that crystal lattice work of, of the minerals, and those minerals can come together, and they'll grow. They'll grow large to the point where you can see them, uh, and then they'll cool and into a rock. So that first picture of granite, you can see the crystals in that granite. However, if I took that same magma that that granite was made out of and cooled it off really quickly, it'd look like glass. It would just look like black glass. However, if by giving it that time, you allow the chemistry to kind of sort itself out and allow minerals to kind of grow big. Uh, and so we can look at a intrusive igneous rock and depending on how big the crystals are in it, it kind of tells you how long it took to cool off. So something with really big crystals, you go, oh, this took a long time to cool off. Or something with smaller crystals, oh, this actually cooled off a little bit quicker. So anyway, these are intrusive igneous rocks, the stuff that cools off uh, under the ground. So here's another kind of a more realistic look at how these things can form. So again, we have kind of a map up here. We've got all these layers here. These are sedimentary rocks. We'll be looking at this stuff. Uh, more often, each little thing is supposed to be a little bit kind of a different sedimentary rock, but kind of a catch-all term uh, is country rock. So it's all the stuff that's around this intrusive igneous body. It's just sort of a, we're just going to call all this stuff country rock. Uh, and it can be anything. It can be other igneous rocks. It can be metamorphic rocks. It can be sedimentary rocks that are in different types or different, you know, horizontal or whatever. Anyway, but I care about this big pink thing. This is an intrusive igneous rock. So this once was a magma that flowed up here and got into this area and melted a lot of these rocks and then eventually slowly cooled off and formed this now intrusive igneous rock. Now what's kind of neat is sometimes you'll get these chunks of the country rock that will fall into the magma and get frozen in that magma as the magma cools off. And we call these things xenoliths xenoliths. So let's uh, take a look at some of those. So here's kind of a pink granite. So this is the intrusive igneous rock. And then there's these xenoliths uh, that are stuck in it. So this was the surrounding country rock and this looks like basalt to me. But uh, the surrounding country rock that kind of fell into that magma and got frozen in it. Got stuck. Kind of neat. 
So let's talk about the different types of intrusive bodies. Uh, the deep stuff, uh, and it doesn't have to be deep. It's, it can be found at the surface, but when it forms, it forms usually uh, in a deeper depth. So we have batholiths, and then shallower things. We have volcanic necks, dikes, and sills. So one of the most famous volcanic necks uh, is Ship Rock. And this is in the Four Corners region, which is where uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado kind of come together in a little corner. Uh, this is near that, that area. And it's this leftover volcanic neck. And so you can see here, there used to be this volcano that kind of sat on top of it. And this is one of the things when I got into the geology that kind of blew me away. And what I never really realized is that a lot of the surface of our planet, there used to be a lot more stuff above it. There used to be a lot more material above our heads, but it's eroded away over time to the point where it's thousands of feet have been eroded away. So there used to be a volcano, not right here. This wasn't the volcano. There was the volcano above it, as drawn over here. And then below it, uh, there's this cool dike, which is this ridge of, uh, of magma that, that flowed along this, this little seam here. So here's a picture of the actual thing. Uh, so there's the volcanic neck, and you can kind of see this ridge, which is a, a dike uh, of magma that flowed through the surrounding rock and then cooled uh, in that area. This looks really similar, right? You've probably seen these things in movies, uh, if you watch westerns especially, or if you watch Forrest Gump, he runs through this area. This is called Monument Valley. And you look at these and you go, oh, those must be volcanic necks too. But they're not. This is just another one of those situations where there used to be much more rock up here and they've eroded down. These are actually sedimentary rocks, and so these layers are actually all connected together at one point. Uh, and how do you tell the difference? By looking at it, you really, it's difficult to. A lot of the times you need to walk up to these things and look at the rock closely to figure out what they are. Once we get more into sedimentary rocks, you'll be able to tell by looking at this stuff, be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's those shales in there, those are sedimentary rocks. But um, to be able to just look at this thing from the distance and look at these things from a distance and tell what they are, it's difficult. It's much easier if you get closer to them. Anyway. So more on dikes and sills. Uh, dikes and sills are basically the same thing. They are just in different directions. So if they're sideways, they're sills. If they are up and down, they're dikes. That simple. So sills will typically form or, or flow along uh, between layers of rocks, and then dikes will kind of cut across them. A lot of times dikes will form uh, where there's faults, so there's breaks in the rock. These dikes will flow through there. So here's a picture of a dike. This is just a ridge where the surrounding, uh, with the surrounding rock around it. So another look at it and kind of tell us this ridge that sticks up. Another look. So that used to be a magma that came up through the rock, the rock that used to be around this whole area and buried this whole area. Uh, it's eroded down and it kind of uncovered all this. So here's on top of a mountain. Uh, here's a sill right here. So it's going sideways. Here's another dike. And of course, just kind of a hodgepodge of dikes and zills uh, that have flowed through these fractures in this rock. So onto the deeper stuff. Uh, when we have melting at depth and we get magmas that are coming up uh, from the lower parts of the crust or even the mantle, uh, these things will slowly flow up, get to a point and start to cool off. And while they're flowing, while they're magma, we call them diapirs. And once they get up here, they can form a batholith. But the individual chunks are called plutons. Not that important. I kind of use the terms plutons and batholiths into, you know, kind of together. It just depends on 
what day it is. Sometimes I'll say Pluton, or sometimes I'll say Betelith. It's not. I don't think it's that that crucial. But this is what's going on. These things are flowing up through the crust and then solidifying. And over time, if we take this surface and erode it down, we can uncover these batholiths or plutons. And if anybody's ever been to uh, the Texas Hill Country, west of uh, Austin, there's this place called Enchanted Rock. And it is this exhumed, this uncovered uh, batholith, or it's just one giant piece of granite. It's kind of neat. It's fun. If you ever get the chance to go there, uh, you get to walk around on one giant piece of granite. So, just to kind of point out what we're dealing with here again, we have a subducting crust. You don't always need a piece of subducting crust to, to have melting down here. You just need some heat from the mantle, and you get this, this uh, magma that's rising up. It'll actually touch sometimes the bottom of the, the continental crust, cause more melting. So this stuff comes here, melts this stuff, and this stuff's now melted and it's moving up uh, and kind of creating these things that we're, we're looking at, these batholiths. So let's kind of move in a little bit to identification and classification and talk a little bit about texture. This is something we're going to, these two terms, when we look at uh, the different rock types. We'll use this a lot. Texture and composition. Texture is basically the size of the grains or the crystals, and sometimes it's not always the size, it's also the shape. Uh, and then composition is the chemistry, or what minerals are there. So here's a piece of granite. It's not very pink in this case. The feldspars here are more white colored. They're not pink. But if you look closely, you can start to identify these little individual minerals. So here we've probably got smoky quartz. This is a feldspar, and this is hard to tell, but a darker mineral. But this is, you know, we'd use this one. We can see this stuff. These are large crystals, so we can we can classify this piece of granite as a type of igneous rock. We classify it as granite. Uh, based on one, the size of the crystals, the fact that we can see them, and two, their composition. Uh, there's a lot of feldspar and a lot of, of quartz. But like I said, more on that later when we get into lab. I'm going to hit you guys with that uh, quite a bit. So we'll stop there. We'll kind of cover this stuff in the lab. Uh, and I'll see you guys in class, unless I want you to cover volcanoes, and I'm pretty sure I want you to. So go ahead and go on to chapter four uh, and we'll talk about extrusive igneous rocks and volcanoes which are always fun to talk about <laughs>